Hey, this is Vince. In this video, we're going to talk about gas fees in Ethereum. Gas fees in Ethereum are being uh, really talked about a lot. People really don't understand what it is. So I'm going to walk you through at a high level, step by step, about what it is, what you should be thinking about, and why you don't have to always react now. You can be patient and be a smart investor, smart allocator of capital, and especially a smart user of the Ethereum network and not overspend on gas. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Ethereum network and one of the key parts of the Ethereum network is really something called gas fees. Gas fees, gas is kind of used as a, a way, a really sort of like a, a real world term so people understand that in order to do work or transactions on the Ethereum network, you need to pay a fuel fee to run on this world computer, this network, because many of the fees apply to operating these decentralized apps. And many of these decentralized apps are composed of one or more smart contracts. And these smart contracts are just programs. These are sort of self-executing rules that execute when a certain condition is put in front of them. In plain English, it basically says, you know, if X, then Y. And that if X is a set of conditions presented to them. If they're given a certain amount of, of tokens in a particular uh, contract at a particular address, then put them here so you can start earning money. That was an oversimplified version of a contract. But in order to do that, in order for that smart contract to run, it actually has to mine Ethereum. Crazy, right? So the contract actually doesn't have to mine Ethereum. The miners, the people running the nodes on the Ethereum network, the 8,400 or so nodes that are sitting around the world, somebody there, one of those people, one of those nodes is a miner. And one of those miners has to do the work. And so what's happening is when you pay gas fees, the gas fees are actually the result of an interesting formula that was, is used uh, to, in essence, put your job up for auction to the miners. So the miners, because the Ethereum network can only run 15 transactions per second, are going to look at your bid and they are going to take the best bid at the time in order to go mine a block to log your transaction. So it's crazy. In order for your transaction to take place, it needs to be logged on the ledger that is a blockchain. But since it can only do 15 transactions per second, there is a contention for resources. So your, the gas fees are in essence a bid. So when you look at gas fees on something like MetaMask, you'll see something like uh, slow, average, and fast. So if you really want your transaction to close fast, the gas fees presumably will be higher than it is if you want it to be low. And you might say, hey, I would rather it be slow, not low, but slow, because it's not really important for me to really execute this transaction right away. And in some cases that may be right, but in some cases when the network is highly trafficked, they may never look at that low fee. So looking at the average fast or fastest fee may be something that you need to look at. And that's something, that sort of strategy is what we're going to cover in our next video. What I'm going to cover here are gas fees at a high level, how they're calculated, and the things that you need to take into consideration as you're looking at running transactions on the Ethereum network. First of all, there aren't a lot of people running transactions every second on the Ethereum network where you are going to be required to use gas. A lot of times it's when you put your uh, capital in a certain place or take your capital out of a certain place. You either want to make a trade or you want to stake something or you want to make a loan or you want to do something. And that trade really is a swap on maybe a decentralized exchange. It's not necessarily a swap on an exchange which is more centralized and they have their own sort of trading fees that don't have anything to do with what we're talking about in this particular uh, video. But if you take a look at these transaction fees, your gas fees are measured in a something called a GUI, 
uh, and it's it, and it's a it's a fraction of an Ethereum. That's just trivia, but it is an actual number that is being calculated because they're not going to charge you a whole Ethereum to make moves. They're going to charge you a fraction of the Ethereum, but that's not the end of it. So it needs to be looked at it from the. In order to understand this, we need to go from the ground up. So there is a basic transaction fee. If you were to send me a token on the Ethereum network, it would just cost this one basis, uh, one basic uh, GUI. That's it, okay? And it's something like uh, 21 something or other. If you were to run a smart contract or a series of smart contracts or a series of transactions, the baseline transaction fee is gonna be based upon the initial fee that is takes to place to go from A to B, it's then on top of that, it's going to be the amount of data that needs to be written into the ledger, into the blockchain, that is all the calculations that need to go into the blockchain to basically say uh, that Vince transacted with Bob and Vince transacted with Bob for 45 ETH and 45 ETH went from Bob to Vince. Right? And it's going to have to write all that, but that's broken down into computer code, but it is data. And that data needs to be written to the blockchain. Okay, so there is a volume of data that's going to need to be written. So you have the basic fee plus that volume of data. Okay, and those are sort of like the volume calculations that go into your gas fee. But on top of that, there is going to be a factor based upon how much traffic is going on on the Ethereum network. We talked briefly about the fact that the Ethereum network is this world computer and these decentralized apps are running on this world computer and we need Ethereum to run. We also talked about that Ethereum can only run 15 transactions per second on its worldwide network across its 84 to 8500 nodes. There is a traffic factor that's going to play into that. So you have your basic fee, the amount of data, and your traffic factor. And the last multiplier in this whole equation will be the current price of Ethereum. Even though you're looking at a fraction of Ethereum, it still comes into play. So a lot of people think gas fees are up because the price of Ethereum are, is up. That is just one factor in the equation. The traffic on the network and the size of the data that's being, data set that's being moved into uh, being written on the blockchain have a lot more to do with it than just the price of gas. So just saying the price of gas is a very elementary and it, uh, uh, way to explain it all away and it just doesn't do it justice. So when you look at this, you're going to have a calculation. Now, here's the thing. There are some smart contracts that are written super efficiently, even though they do a whole lot. So their gas fees may be look like a lot, but if it was separate transactions, it may be massive. If it was inefficient, it may be massive. In some frameworks and some smart contracts, you really don't have uh, a choice in terms of how they run based upon the kind of decisions they need to make. In some of these smart contracts, when a smart contract is deployed to the blockchain, the smart contract is there. It's running independently. You can't, unless you throw that entire smart contract away and start all over, you can't do an update to that smart contract for the most part. So you have to understand the way it was architected from the beginning has a lot to do with the people architecting it and understanding what they wanted to solve. Some people might have wanted to solve a problem and they kind of left the efficiency of the transaction and how, many, how much they would be causing their uh, customers to pay in gas fees behind because it may have been written and deployed at a time when gas fees and traffic and the price of Ethereum were inconsequential. But with the increase in price of gas and the increase in the number of people using the Ethereum network, specifically for DeFi, these factors have come into play. So some of these markets are efficient or not. The best return for your capital should always be your primary objective. And if you have to make these transactions once, if you have to make these transactions twice, or if you have to make them five times, they're worth it to get your transactions moving. So when you're calculating your return, you need to take into consideration this cost as part of it. So when people make transactions on the Ethereum network, a critical thing is 
that they think that um, when they're starting off, let's say I'm going to spend $1,000 and the $1,000 USD equivalent of Ethereum and want to run a transaction. And so I was like, I'm going to go invest $1,000. In reality, if all you have is $1,000, you need to be thinking about something like $900 or $889 just to leave enough to make the transaction. Not just the transaction in, but ultimately the transaction out. Sometimes you're going to need to leave some Ethereum as gas fees in or out. Uh, there's an old joke about um, ATMs. So if you run out of gas fees and you get into a situation in which you want to trade out, you're trapped. So this joke about an ATM, it's like going to an ATM and it only dispenses 20 and you only have $19 in the bank. It's not an exact equivalent, but in essence, you're trapped in that situation. You really can't get anything out. And you never want to have too many, um, leave too much behind. But if you have the ability to transfer some in from outside of the, um, outside of, let's say, your MetaMask wallet in, when you need to make these gas fee transactions, you can. You need to allocate enough Ethereum to pay for your gas fees in and your gas fees out. And if you're doing something as a group, if you're doing something with other people, ask them how many transactions they had. Ask them if you could take a look at the number of transactions it took them on Etherscan to get into this. For example, I worked with uh, someone the other day and we took um, Ethereum out of Gemini and we took that Ethereum out of Gemini and swapped that Ethereum for um, you know, another token on Uniswap. So we had to pay one or two transactions in Uniswap, one for their first permission to use Uniswap, another transaction for their, um, the actual swap, and then they wanted to move it to Balancer. So they, they um, were able to, they, they got, they, we opened up and we made a transaction in Balancer. We got permission in Balancer to trade and that is actually a transaction that needed to take place. Then we got it, had to get permissions to unlock the token, and that was another gas fee and transaction. And then we made another transaction to actually add liquidity. Then we made another transaction to go ahead and stake. But in order to stake, we had to get permission to stake, and that was a transaction. And then we went in and actually paid the transaction fee to stake it. So in essence, we made probably eight transactions, which when I looked back at our transactions cost us um, at the time we did it, maybe about, this was in uh, early December, it cost us $69 to make just those transactions. If you added those transactions on to the transaction fee that it took them to come into um, um, the Ethereum blockchain from Gemini, because they decided to trade, at my recommendation, decided to trade their cash fiat dollars in Gemini into Ethereum and then just move Ethereum over uh, to their MetaMask wallet because they could have employed another strategy. With the trading fee from the thousand dollars, they brought in eight ninety five, and the, and then from that point, they were able to do all the work they needed to do. I think they brought in less than a thousand because that eight ninety five seems a lot, but it actually could be that much. So they brought in $8.95 and then they took a hit, another hit on another $69. So you can see the delta from where they came in at $1,000 and always, and they also left enough out there where they need another, I guess the equivalent is another $84, $85 in gas fees are still sitting in their MetaMask wallet to facilitate any trades in or out. I know that seems like a lot, but when you walk through the process, the returns that this person is realizing they've made their um, they've made the loss back from the fees they've now made their returns and they're watching it in a, from a long-term perspective if they have to trade in or out they're going to make the call one of the things that we've been able to do is we've been able to write a small program inside of facebook messenger a messenger bot application that actually goes out and checks the um, gas fees on a periodic basis because traffic changes, the price changes, the congestion of the network changes. So you can get an ad hoc view of the price and you can get a um, periodic update. Let's say that you don't want to 
run your transaction now. You might want to run it in 15 minutes. It'll come back and give you the fees in, in 15 minutes and give you that sort of uh, directional bump with a little bit of a threshold. In our next video, we're going to walk through a whole lot of uh, detail around what it takes to actually manipulate um, your MetaMask transactions, looking at the price of gas and looking at what you need to take into consideration. It's sort of an advanced sort of function, but it's something that everyone's going to need to do in order to really understand how to get the most out of what they're doing on the Ethereum network and gas fees. So in summary, gas fees are the price you pay to work on the Ethereum network. It starts off with a basic fee, the amount of data the smart contract is going to facilitate, the, and it's going to be factored by the amount of traffic on the network, and it's also going to be a factor of the price of Ethereum. You don't have to make your transaction right away. You can wait later, but if you're going to look at transactions, you have to understand that if you are going to use this and you're trying to get out fast or get in fast, you're probably going to be best served by working on the high or fast or fastest end of the gas fee bid that you're going to make, in our example, in a MetaMask wallet, um, in order to get your transaction taken so somebody doesn't really get your spot and take advantage of what you're doing. But if you have a little bit more time, you can err on a lower side. As we look at more advanced settings, we'll be able to do even more. So hopefully this has been helpful and not really confusing. I'm going to try to write something about this up on Medium as well, so you kind of have a, a walkthrough of what we're thinking about. But I just wanted to make sure that you understood what gas fees are because I've been looking so much online and people say, well, gas fees are out of control. Unless you're running $10,000, it doesn't make sense to do anything in DeFi. They're just keeping you out of the game because it's a game that requires patience, thinking, and consideration. And I know you guys have it. Thank you.